going to go on a little journey today. Uh, now, I assure you, we are going to wind up very soundly in Scripture, uh, so, so you're not going to miss out as far as that goes. Uh, but like I said, this is Reformation Sunday. Uh, that is the German Reformation, why I'm dressed such. Uh, but what does that or what should that mean to us? I mean, we're talking the German Reformation 500 years ago. How does it impact us as Nazarenes today? as individual Christians today. Well, we're going to get there. But I want us to begin by going back uh, nearly five or over 500 years to All Saints Day or All Hallows' Eve, 1517, Wittenberg, Germany. Uh, All Saints Day, of course, is celebrated in the church on November 1st. If you follow the Christian calendar at all, and most of us probably don't, uh, but November 1st is All Saints Day, which makes the day before All Saints Day, all or All Saints Day was called All Hallows Day, so the day before was All Hallows Eve, or Halloween, which is where that comes from. Uh, the Halloween, of course, not being part of the Christian calendar, but All Saints Day, or All Hallows Day, is very much a part of the Christian calendar. Uh, but the sovereign in, in Wittenberg, Frederick the Wise, uh, he had a, uh, a, a passion for collecting relics. Now, this was a Catholic thing. Uh, so he would collect just about anything, a piece of bone or a piece of cloth or a, a piece of wood, anything that was related to Christ or the apostles or any number of the saints. And it was during the season of All Saints Day that he would take these to Castle Church in Wittenberg. And you notice that's a German pronunciation, W. Wittenberg. That's about the extent of my German, so I'm not going any farther than that. But it was, he would do that on All Saints Day to the Castle Church in Wittenberg and, and put some of these relics on display because, you know, as good Catholics, as faithful followers, uh, they, they can gain some points by gazing on a, a relic, spiritual points, by gazing, gazing on uh, some relics. Uh, so we'll see. Now, now I'm going to mention here that um, we lived in Germany for, for a few years as uh, when I, I, one of the nice things about being in the Army and one of the slogans years ago was, join the army, see the world, and we definitely did. We lived in Germany for several years, and my sons and I were able to go on a, a Luther pilgrimage. And, and we went to many of the, the Martin Luther sites, and, and those are some of the pictures we're going to see. Now, this isn't like going to Grandpa's house and seeing the whole movies of every little thing that happened, and the picnic, and the pie, and all that. This is, but this is taking us on a, a journey uh, through a little bit of history uh, but we're going to wind up, like I said, very soundly in Scripture and, and what this means to us. Uh, but I'm a history buff, so there's going to be a, a good chunk of history in here as well, uh, which will, like I said, will get us where, where we want to go. So, so Martin Luther knew, of course, that there'd be the large crowds there because of All Saints Day and the relics. So he took the opportunity to tail, nail you know, the 95 theses that, that we hear about, took the opportunity to nail those on the door, of the castle church. This is uh, the castle church in Wittenberg. That door opening uh, was a place where he nailed those 95 theses, those uh, concerns that he had about the church, which catapulted Germany into the Reformation and the church, uh, the Reformation of the church, which made history. So I want us to look back, as I said, a little bit about Martin Luther's life very briefly and how he got to be the author of such a great Reformation. Martin Luther was born in 1483 uh, in a little town in Saxony called Eiselben. Uh, in this little house, uh, he and his parents lived. Uh, now, Martin's parents were, uh, they started out pretty poor. Uh, Hans and Margaret Luther, uh, this is a courtyard of their home. Hans and Margaret Luther, and they were peasants, uh, but his, his father worked really hard to, to raise the uh, status of the family. Uh, he was, which is interesting here in West Virginia, uh, we have friends visiting. Friday we went to the Coal Miners Museum in Beckley. Uh, well, the Luther family, they were miners. Uh, Martin Luther's father, Hans, worked in a mine, and he later was the owner of several mines and worked hard to raise the status of the family as he became a small-scale uh, businessman. Uh, but Martin Luther was born there, as I said, in 1505, so we're going forward quite a ways. As a young adult, uh, Martin Luther was in Erfurt, Germany. 
Uh, in the early 1500s, he went to the university there in, in Erfurt uh, to study law. Uh, law and the church really were the only two places you could have a really solid profession or, or a, uh, a, uh, um, one that can get you somewhere. Uh, so he chose to, to study law at the Erfurt University. Uh, so in July, though, in 1505, and you've probably seen this if you've watched any of the Martin Luther movies or read anything about him, in 1505, in July, he was caught in a storm, an awful storm. Uh, you know, a, a, and, of course, he was walking or, or perhaps on horseback, but uh, he was out in the elements, and he was caught in this storm, and it was such a bad storm that he quite literally feared for his life. Uh, he, he was afraid of losing his life, and he swore to God in those moments that if he would, God would save him from the storm, that he would become a monk. Well, God did save him from the storm, uh, and Luther followed through on that promise. And within a couple weeks, uh, he entered the Reformed Congregation of the Eremitical Order of St. Augustine in Erfurt, uh, in the town that he was uh, studying law. Uh, this is one, this is, uh, one side of that uh, monastery. This is the other side of that monastery. And this Catholic, it was, of course, a Catholic monastery, and it dates to the 13th century. It's still there today. However, now, interestingly, it's no longer a Catholic monastery, but it's a Lutheran uh, place. I don't know that they'd call it a monastery, but they actually have a Lutheran, at least one Lutheran nun, that works there. And there was a, a deal, of course, this was a, a significant site in Lutheran history, but it was a Catholic monastery, uh, so they worked a, out a deal that when the last a uh, Catholic resident there died that it would turn over to the, the Lutherans. And, of course, the uh, Catholics spread that out for a long time. And it, it relatively recent history, it became a Lutheran site. Uh, but but they, they have, uh, of course, places of worship there. They do conferences there. They have guest rooms there where my sons and I were able to stay within almost earshot of where Martin Luther uh, was while he was studying uh, to be a priest. It said that this was a gate, a very modest gate. It said that this was the gate that Luther entered the monastery through. And, and as men entered, of course, it was just men there at the, at the time, as men entered the, the monastery to prepare for ministry, they were given a small room to live in. And you can kind of get a picture that's a very small room and a small mat that they had uh, to sleep on, very little furnishings. Uh, but this was called a cell, um, I mean, it was very much like a small prison cell, but it was called a cell that they lived in. And this, this cell is what they surmised was Martin Luther, the one that he occupied. On the left side, you can see it from the outside. The right picture, you see the inside. Uh, and they base this on the writings, his journal writings and that, because they've got one little window there to look out. And when he wrote about things that he could see, he wrote about uh, a garden that was just outside of his window. Uh, so from one of those windows, he was able to look out, and they were able to, based on how he described what he saw, determine that that was where he was. Uh, he studied to be a priest, as we know, at the monastery. And if you watch the movie, the movie's uh, pretty accurate in, in his, um, as he celebrated Mass for the first time uh, as an ordained priest, that, that he was so overcome by the feeling of the presence of God that that, that he just really fouled up the, the liturgy. Um, you remember the newest movie of Luther, his, his father really got all over him about that because he didn't like him going into religion instead of law. Uh, but but this, uh, this altar there, this stone altar there at the monastery in Erfurt, they, they believe was the place where he celebrated Mass for the first time uh, based on several different things about the altar, uh, the age of it, the place for relics for it, and all those things. So very likely this was the place where Martin Luther celebrated Mass for that first time when he became an ordained priest. Uh, just a few years after being ordained, uh, 1507, he was sent as a, on a temporary assignment to Wittenberg uh, to fill in there at the university. Uh, but then he, went, he took time after that, went to Rome. He was in Rome for several years where he began to see uh, some of the abuses of the church uh, when he spent that time in Rome. The things that the the faithful followers would do, would have to do, would feel obligated to do uh, as part of their road to salvation. He began to see those, those, uh, those, those abuses. 1511, he came back to Wittenberg. Uh, he completed his studies at the university there in Wittenberg, became a doctor, a doctor of theology, uh, not, not a medical doctor, but a doctor uh, when he came back. In 1514, he became... Uh, the parish priest 
at the city church in Wittenberg. Uh, so that, that's a parish uh, church there. Uh, he became a priest there, presiding at that church, and, and this is seen from the town square. So if you're standing looking at the city church here, to your back, if you were to turn around, you'd see the castle church, which we're going to talk about uh, in a few minutes. Uh, the city church, though, built in the late uh, 1200s, a large, not a very large church, but a beautiful church. Uh, inside the church, it has the high altar there in the back that dates back to the mid-1500s, just a little bit after uh, Martin Luther was there. Uh, but, but Martin Luther, of course, he was an, an avid student, a scholar of the Bible. He was consistently studying. He was a brilliant thinker. He was always in the Word, always learning, always wanting to understand uh, the Scripture. And he began to see inconsistencies in the Catholic Church, uh, possibly the most notable being uh, the, the, re, the, the giving of indulgences uh, so that we can give money to the church to kind of speed our way through purgatory, or we could give money to the church so our, our relatives who may be there could speed their way through purgatory. And Martin Luther felt that this discouraged, and of course, at this time, they were doing that to build a big cathedral. I think it was St. Peter's at the time in Rome. So they were getting these indulgences so that the Pope could build his buildings. And, and for Luther, he felt like it discouraged the faithful from giving to the poor or performing other acts of mercies. Because if they could speed their way through purgatory, they'd much rather give their money to the church in that way. So this is a castle church. Uh, Martin Luther made a list of these incons inconsistencies between the church and the Bible, wanting to discuss or debate them with other scholars. He wasn't out to, to, to begin a reformation. He wasn't out to, to, to start a new denomination. He wasn't out to change the world. He was out to, to get his church, the Catholic church, back on track. And so he made this list of, of the 95 things that, that he saw as being inconsistent with Scripture, uh, and he nailed them to the door at the Wittenberg Church here, uh, the Castle Church in Wittenberg, for others to see. And that was common. If a scholar, if a theologian, if a minister, if, a, if they wanted to, to debate a topic or discuss a topic, they would put it, they'd just take it to the castle church, nail it to the, the wooden door there. Uh, so, so he wasn't out again. This wasn't some dramatic thing, you know, like, like spraying things on the church door, uh, but, but it was a common thing. He took these concerns that he had, nailed them to the church door to create a discussion, to, to talk about them, to try to get them to some resolution. Uh, so this is the inside of the Castle Church in Wittenberg um, where my sons and I were able to attend worship, which was really cool. Uh, but but I, when you worship, and by the way, and this isn't what this is all about here, but right there is my two sons. That's Jacob. That's Jonathan's back. But anyway, that's not what we're about. Uh, when you exit the worship service at the Castle Church in Wittenberg, you exit through the door that Martin Luther had nailed his 95 theses. Uh, at the time, of course, it was a wooden door. Now it's a, a metal door. Uh, the wooden doors were burned up during the Thirty Years' War uh, some time ago. But now the metal doors, they have engraved on them the 95 theses that, that Luther had written and posted there. But again, he just wanted to discuss his concerns. He wanted to debate them. He wanted the church to draw closer to what was biblical. Uh, but these people got a hold of them, copied them, duplicated them, distributed them widely. Uh, copies were sent to the hierarchy, both religious and civil. And the church and civil leaders, because this is, remember, the 1500s, the church was very much in charge. And you don't speak out against the church. You don't criticize the church. You don't raise the suggestion that the church might be wrong. And the church and civil rulers tried to get Martin Luther to back down on speaking against the church. But we know that he did not. In 1521, he was called the Worms uh, for a diet. Uh, if you see that in print, you see a, it's not a diet of worms. They weren't eating worms, but it's a diet of worms. Uh, but, but at the end, it's like a, a, a legislative assembly or a court session. And, and, he, and Martin Luther thought that finally the church is listening. 
finally I'm going to get to share my concerns. We can look through Scripture. We can talk about them and debate them. And we can maybe come to some place where the church gets closer to where Scripture is. But that's what it it is not what it turned out to be. He discovered that if he did not recant, if he did not back down, that he would be excommunicated from the church and probably worse, be killed because they killed heretics still in that time. There were uh, several Lutheran, what became Lutheran, there were several German Reformation uh, men who were killed because of the heresy, the heresy that they were teaching. Uh, But as we know, when he went to Worms, and this is St. Peter's Church in Worms, built in the 1200s, uh, was not part of the Diet, but it was there uh, when, when uh, Martin Luther was, was there. This is the Holy Trinity Church, a Lutheran church, built in the 1700s, but built on the site where this Diet took place. Uh, so it's a memorial church uh, for what Luther uh, stood for. Uh, so the, the church hierarchy demanded that Martin Luther confess his error and return to the true teachings of the church. But finally... Martin Luther stood, and we probably know part of this uh, that we have heard. He stood and said, I cannot and will not recant anything. For to go against conscience is neither right nor safe. Here I stand. I can do no other. So help me God. So at this point, his life was uh, uh, in danger. He was officially labeled a heretic. Um, very likely he, he could have been killed, but upon leaving Worms on his way back to Wittenberg, he was whisked away by his, uh, uh, arranged by his, Frederick the Wise, who was his sovereign uh, for the area where he lived. And, and he was taken then to uh, uh, Wartburg Castle in uh, the Sa- Saxony area in Eisenach, where he was able to be protected. Uh, this castle was built in the 1200s. Newer portions were added as the years went by, of course. Uh, and th- this is the room where, uh, where Martin Luther stayed. Two pictures of it. Um, it was above where the royalty would stay when they visited the castle. This was the place where they would uh, lock up criminals. Uh, so that it was a safe place to put Martin Luther to protect him. Uh, but it was in this room. Now, now, none of these things in the picture are original to when Luther was, Luther was there, except for that... Uh, if you can see it right there, that's a whale vertebrae. And he mentions that in his, his writings, in his journal, mentions that whale, vertebra, whale vertebrae. Uh, but but it, it was in this room uh, where he was there for about 10 months. Um, and while he was there, he began to translate the, the Bible into German. And that's significant for reformers because to reform, to, to, for a reformation to happen, the people needed to be on board. And at the time, the, la- the Bible was not in the language of the people. It would be in Latin. And, and the, so the priests would interpret that for them and tell them, here's what you believe, here's what it says. So, so he translated, began at Wartburg, the castle there, he began translating the Bible into German. Uh, so 1522, uh, he realizes that the, um, the Reformation was getting off track, and he had to get back to the Reformation uh, so he, he left Wartburg, went back to Wittenberg, um, and still this was at the risk of his life, but he needed to get the, the Reformation back on track. He took over or took up residence at a former monastery there in Wittenberg. It became a hub for the Reformation. It's now called the Luther House or Luther, Luther Haas, Haas in German. Um, he, the, while he was there, he married a former Catholic nun, Catherine von Bora, with whom he had six children. Uh, while at Wittenberg, the first edition of the Bible in German quickly sold out. A second edition, shown here with illustrations that's on display at the Luther House, uh, also sold extremely well. Um, 1546, he went to Eiselberg as a de facto leader of the Reformation. He was called there to, to settle some disputes. Uh, and while he was there, uh, he, he was in residence there at this house. Uh, and, and he grew sick, got very sick, and he died on 18 February. 1546, uh, in a room or a bed very much like that one on the left, and there on the right is his death, ma- death mask, which was on display there. Uh, some of the things that came out of the Reformation, uh, he, he was a prolific writer as well. 
uh, as a reformer, and he wrote several hymns. Um, three of those looked down, O Lord, from heaven. Behold, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. And a mighty fortress is our God. It's my fault we sung that this morning. Uh, I know that's a tough one to sing as a congregational hymn, but it's, if you had the opportunity to listen to the words, you could see uh, the Reformation themes in that. Uh, and, and how what they were against and how God would help them through. And I encourage you to maybe take a look at those. Sometimes I was going to share that, but we're running out of time. I don't want to take the time now. But there were, there were several Reformation scriptures here <coughs> that were part of the Reformation. Romans um, 1.7, to, Rome, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage for the Reformation emphasized faith in God's grace and not in works, which was a, was a significant aspect of the Reformation. 1 Peter 2, 5, Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. This, for the Reformation, emphasized the priesthood of all believers. There wasn't the necessary of the necessity of the ordained priesthood as the Catholic Church of the time recognized it. Then 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, which emphasized the sola scriptura, or the scripture alone. The church emphasized what the Pope said. They emphasized tradition. Uh, but this scripture for the Reformation emphasized that scripture had what we needed, all things that we would need to know for salvation. And then Matthew, take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. This passage, of course, emphasizes the removal of the burden that the church placed on the people, the tremendous burden and the rights and the requirements on their road to salvation. But Jesus said his yoke is easy, his burden is light. And then Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, which emphasized God's grace in the work of the believer. The Reformation had a lot of influence. Of course, we have the hymns and the scripture passages that came out of it. But more important for us, of course, it, it initiated or it contributed to, it gave impetus to the Catholic counter-Reformation, which had already begun to take place. But it was not just against the Protestant Reformation, but toward internal renewal. And there were some things, positive things, that came about in the Catholic Church as a part of the German Reformation. But then it also gave, uh, gave uh, some uh, power to the English Reformation, which was more of an administrative reformation. But their, their, um, transfer, their, their transition from being a Catholic Church to the Church of England or Anglican. And of course, it influenced John and Charles Wesley, getting closer to home here, as their hearts were strangely warmed. Uh, John Wesley wrote after reading uh, Martin Luther. For John Wesley, it was Luther's preface to the book of Romans, uh, which illuminated God's change, um, illuminating the change that God works in the hearts of people through faith. And then for Charles Luther, the hymn writer, it was Luther's notes on Galatians, which convinced him, according to Charles, that God loved me and gave himself for me. And then Charles soon wrote the hymn, And Can It Be?, which shares and testifies to a changed life through God's grace. So this is important to us because, of course, we're not descended from Lutheranism or German Lutheranism, but it impacted the English Reformation. And, of course, John and Charles Wesley were Anglican priests, and they very much influenced by uh, Anglicanism. And, of course, as they, uh, in their Aldersgate experience, as they... Uh, probably saved for the first time there, but their hearts being strangely warm and their understanding and rediscovery of some scriptural, scriptural uh, thoughts uh, like uh, the holiness and entire sanctification that we uh, are a part of. The, the influence of Martin Luther flowed through all of this uh, to us today. Uh, but, but more than that, more than changing a church, more than changing countries or, or, or nations, Luther, Wesley, and the others should move us to be reformed, not from the church's teachings or practices, but from a life dead to sin to a life alive in Christ.